Hey, everybody. Good morning. It's 8 a.m. And what does that mean? Do you know what that means? <laughs> I don't know. What does it mean, Dustin? <laughs> <laughs> I think it means we should start lightning talks. Woo! Okay. Uh, so first up, we have Pandy, who's going to talk to us about, I can't see the slide, how to write a test case, of course. Let's give it up for Pandy. Hey, y'all. Dajahal, my name is Pandy Knight, and I'm the Automation Panda. I'm a developer advocate at Apple Tools and director of Test Automation University. Today, I'm going to show you a simple but powerful technique for writing test cases like a pro. First, let's define testing. Testing is interaction plus verification. That's it. You do something, and you make sure it works. A test case is a procedure for making those interactions and verifications. There are several kinds of tests, like unit tests, integration tests, or end-to-end -end tests. But all functional tests do the same basic thing. They try something and report pass or fail. That's how testing keeps us safe. Testing provides an empirical feedback loop for development. With tests, we know when things break. Without tests, coding can be dangerous. The last thing we want to deploy are big old bugs. So if we intend to spend time writing tests, how can we write good tests? There's a simple but powerful pattern I like to follow. Arrange, act, assert. Arrange, act, assert is a great way to structure your test cases. It prescribes an order of operations. First, arrange inputs and targets. Arrange steps should set up the test case. Does the test require any objects or special settings? Does it need to prep a database? Does it need to log into a web app? Handle all these operations at the start of the test. Second, act on the target behavior. Act steps should cover the main thing to be tested. This could be calling a function or method, calling a REST API, or interacting with a web page, or anything else you need to do. Keep actions focused on the target behavior. Third, assert expected outcomes. Act steps should elicit some sort of response. Assert steps verify the goodness or badness of that response. Sometimes assertions are as simple as checking numbers or string values, but other times they may require checking multiple facets of a system or using something like visual snapshots. Assertions will ultimately determine if the test passes or fails. You may have seen a range act assert in a different way. Gherkin's given when then format from BDD is the same thing as a range act assert, just with different words. So here's a basic unit test for Python's absolute value function. I wrote this using PyTest. This test may seem trivial, but we can use it to illustrate our pattern. The arrange step creates a variable named negative for testing. The act step calls the abs function using the negative variable and stores the return value in a variable named answer. And the assert step verifies that answer is a positive value. I like to write comments denoting each phase of the test case as well. Let's kick it up a notch with a more complicated test. The example test, uh, this example tests the DuckDuckGo instant answer API using the requests package that I'm sure many of you have used. The arrange step forms an endpoint URL for searching for Python programming. Notice the base URL and the query parameters. The act steps call the API using the URL with requests and then parse the response body from JSON into a Python dictionary. The assert steps then verify the HTTP status code was 200, meaning OK or success. And the word Python appears somewhere in the response's abstract text. We can clearly see that a range act assert pattern works for both unit tests and feature tests. So why should we use a range act assert? It makes each test focus on an individual behavior independently. If a test fails, you'll know the reason clearly. Remember, simple is better than complex. So thank you for listening to my lightning talk. Again, I'm the Automation Panda. If you want to learn more about testing and automation, check out Test Automation University. We've got about 70 courses for free. And I'll see you today at 1.45 for my talk, Managing the Test Data Nightmare. Thank you.
Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, up next, we have Shreya. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Shreya, and I'm a product manager at Microsoft. Today, I'm gonna talk to you all about computational thinking and the potential effects of incorporating it into school curriculums. So when I was in the fourth grade, I had to figure out what day it would be 100 days from Tuesday. So to come up with my answer, I wrote on a page the days Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so on until I filled the whole sheet of paper. And then I counted from one to 100. And I did this about three times because I really, really wanted to make sure that I got the right answer. In contrast, today, if I find myself repeating the same task even once, I think to myself, you know, there must be a better way. Like, <laughs> I could probably automate this or something could be different here to make this a more streamlined workflow. Um, but this kind of reasoning can also be classified as pattern recognition, and this reasoning should be taught to students in all disciplines across all curriculums because it can really change the way we solve and analyze problems. So what is computational thinking? The way I like to think about computational thinking is that it's computer science concepts at their very core. So it's the ideas behind inventing effective solutions, but with no regards to the syntax or the structure of writing the actual code. Computational thinking contains four main components, decomposition, pattern recognition, abstraction, and algorithm design. These concepts directly play a role in computer science, but they also have a lot of value across all other disciplines, as well as, well as real world scenarios. So when each of you got here to this convention center, at some point or another, it's probably likely that you had to go out of your way to find a room for a talk. For me to find this room, I went through the following steps. First, I looked around, are there any signs to the room? And if so, perfect, I found it. And if not, I picked a random direction to walk in and went back to step one. And I kept repeating this process over and over again until I found the room. So what I wanna explain here is that without even knowing it, without even thinking about it, I was using decomposition for so many different scenarios this weekend. And by calling out my thought process, I can now optimize for better results and also carry over this logic to other aspects of my life. So you might be thinking now, why focus on computational thinking, right? Why don't we just teach everyone how to code, especially because we've had really good results with Python, which is an excellent in introductory language. And we've seen you know, how young students are able to successfully pick it up. So I really wanna emphasize that my proposition is not that we replace teaching code with teaching computational thinking. Rather, I feel that computational thinking is a really solid precursor before we teach coding. Um, and I feel like given the educational resource constraints that do exist across the world, um, and they do contribute to the barrier in entry when it comes to development, I think computational thinking is a great way to start, especially because we don't have to make a new class for computational thinking. So it's not like you know, we're adding a subject to coursework, nothing like that. It's really actually just adding material to existing curriculums and reframing different, like conversations to make them more computational thinking based. So when I talked about finding the room earlier this weekend, uh, or this week, all of you probably thought, well, yeah, I, I did that too, right? I somehow found the rooms that I went to. And my point is, you know, like, you didn't do anything new because I talked about that. It's just that you looked at it in a different way. You, you framed how maybe you see that same problem. So in that same theme, I feel that computational thinking should really lie beneath lesson plans and change the perspective in which the next generations can solve and analyze problems. As you go on for the rest of the day and perhaps the rest of the week, I encourage you to think about what medial tasks that you're completing and what, if any, component of computational thinking they might fall into. With that, Thank you all so much for listening. If you want to discuss further or have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Patrick, who's going to talk to us about wait, what are we talking about? Latest.cat. OK, let's see what it is. Latest.cat, give him a round of applause. Um, yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, today, I wanted to show you a tool that I've been building for couple of weeks um, and I never showed anyone to be honest um, but I think it's quite quite useful so uh, my issue was that every time I wanted to install the latest version of Python or a version you know the latest version of 3.7 I was 
having to go to python.org, then trying to find it maybe in the home page, and then you know you had to find a couple of steps to to go and you know just find the version and then you know putting into your uh, you know favorite uh, tool for installing Python. So I built this tool that's called latest.cat where you can write the uh, software name, which works with a couple of languages at the moment, but can be improved. So you type it and then it gives you the once you get the latest version for for the Python uh, that you want to check, and it should work also for. Uh, 3.6, but that works on the command line. I'm sh gonna show you an example now. Um, so, yeah, made this quick demo here that you can use it uh, using curl. So you can do curl dash l dash s uh, Python, and then it it loads the latest Python version. Also works with other tools like Node.js, and it also works for some reason with SSH, uh, which I think is quite cool. And it was just fun to do. Uh, there's gonna be a demo for that in a second. This is probably useless, but it was fun to do. Um, uh, yeah, and hopefully it's, it's gonna be useful for uh, any of you. Um, it's, it, it's open source, so you can add uh, additional um, languages by going here. Um, let's see, there's a software, software the YAML. It works with Go, Swift, Python, PHP, Rust, and other things. And yeah, if you, if, if you need something like this, if you need other tools, you just send a pull request and happy to, to merge it. Um, yeah, and the, that's me. Uh, that's not my cat, but this is my cat. Thank you. I am a huge cat person, so that makes me very happy. <laughs> Up next, we have Ray. Hi, I'm Ray from Data Science Rebalanced. We make data science tutorials uh, to help bridge the gap between academia and industry. Uh, Today we'll talk about behavior-driven machine learning. So let's say you wanna build a machine learning model. You're gonna need some data, push it through a training pipeline, and ultimately end up with model parameters. So how was I taught to do this in school? I was usually given a data set, let's call it a binary classification. The two colors here represent the two classes. And I would be taught to use all of the data available split it into a train test split. But not all data is actually equal. If I look at this data set, some of this data is more important than the rest. This data in particular. So how would I do it now that I'm in an industry? Well, I would think of my data set as a collection of behaviors, and I want to iteratively find all of the behaviors that are important from my data set. If I look at this data set, <clears throat> you might think, well, just take a random sample. But there's an issue with random sampling. It actually can lead to increased bias. For example, if I have a certain portion of my space where there's a dense amount of data points, if I randomly sample, that portion of the space will be overrepresented, therefore producing bias. As such, I actually want to take a clustering approach and then randomly sample, let's say, three data points from each one of my clusters, represented by the three green dots in each cluster here. Those green dots represent my initial training set that I build a model with. Now, if my model is represented by this red line, my model thinks everything above the line should be a blue dot and everything below it should be an orange dot. But clearly, it's got a few things off. So how do I correct this? Well, that red line also happens to be the area where my model is confused. In binary classification, this would be a 50% confidence score. And so I wanna select items that are around that 50% confidence score and add them to my original green dot training set. So now I have a larger data set, slightly larger, and I build a new model. I go from my first model to my second model. That's a little bit better. But I can repeat this process again with my second model, grabbing data points near 50% confidence, slapping them into a training set, and going ahead and going from my second model onto a third model. But what does this actually mean in the real world? I'm probably gonna actually run this process about 100 times. 
every time adding extra data onto my data set. And what each dot represents is a newly trained model. So my performance metric will improve, and at some point it will actually top out. And after that, as I add more data, I'm actually gonna get worse performing models. So what does this end up buying us? A few things. First, if I have a labeled data set, I can actually build the best model possible, which probably isn't the one that uses all of my data. If I have an unlabeled data set, I can save a lot of time in labeling because I don't need to label the entire data set. And as we discussed already, I can reduce the bias in the model with this approach. If you're interested in this topic, in academia it's often referred to as active learning. There's a wonderful book called Human in the Loop Machine Learning by Robert Monarch. And if you're interested in any other data science content, please reach out to Data Science Rebalanced. We have a link tree. We teach all kinds of courses on Skillshare and provide Medium articles. So reach out at any time. Thank you so much for your time. Awesome. Thank you, Ray. And next up, we have Gear, who's going to talk to us about reading peps, right? Oh, I see it now. Reading peps. Let's give him a round of applause. Yeah, th thank you so much. And my name is uh, Gay Daniela. I work with Real Python, uh, creating content there. And now I want to talk to you about the joy of reading peps. So uh, I suppose one of the things you hear quite early in your Python journey is uh, the pep8 document. But the pep part of this is often not really explained. So what are these peps? Uh, they are Python enhancement proposals. And these are actually fairly technical documents that are specifications for how Python should work, new features of Python, and also how uh, the processes, the governance of Python is implemented. Uh, really technical stuff that really needs to go into the details to show off all, all, all kind of edge cases that you have on, with them. Uh, one of the things I really like about reading PEPs is that they're also historical notes, that they show how the language has evolved over time. They, they often capture some of the discussions that were made before introducing a feature and also some of the decisions and especially also which things were left out of the PEPs. Uh, the, there was a, yeah, it's, it's been available online essentially all the time and it's also on GitHub and that's a, a nice place to go back and look at the history of this. But uh, in February this year, the, they redesigned the webpage and now launched peps.python.org. Uh, and we can have a quick look at this. Uh, so it's this very nice page. And if you just go to peps.python.org, you come to the index of all the peps. And we can kind of scroll down and see that there's a lot of documentation here. Uh, the pep8 that you may have heard about is here, the style guide for Python guide. And this is... Uh, Definitely one of the more read readable pe peps that really goes into some of the more, uh, yeah, ways that we have agreed that we should write Python to make it Pythonic. Um, what I've also done since I've been reading quite a lot of these uh, when I'm creating tutorials, I've also created a small uh, Python package called pepdocs. And this provides the pep command, which give, makes it easier to just download these peps. So if I go into a terminal like this, I can also just type pep8, and we see, okay, something happened here at least. Uh, so let me just pipe this into less, and we can see that this is the, the same document that we saw. Uh, so here, we have the same introduction and these kind of things. But now I have it in a terminal, so I can start to play with things in the terminal. Uh, additionally, there's a few more things I can do here. So if I look at the help, we can see that I can also actually open this web page quite easily just by typing minus W, it pops up. Uh, so if I don't want to go to the browser and actually play around with this, um, I can also uh, convert this to markdown. So the, the, the format of PEPs is that they're in uh, REST uh, format, restructured text. But sometimes markdown is easier to work with for, uh, for, for many tools. So for instance, now I open a different PEP, this is PEP 13 about how the language is governed. It talks about the steering council, which we'll also get to see afterwards. Uh, but I can now also then save this to a file. Now I have it here, and I can, for instance, use the nice rich project to just look at this. Uh, let's see, page here, actually. Uh, and we have a much more nicely formatted markdown here. Uh, so yeah, Th thank you, Rich. 
Uh, and also, uh, I, I can then use something like, let's say, pen, uh, let's see, we need the markdown, uh, pandoc to convert this directly to PDF. So if I now do pep657 PDF, I, I now have a, uh, let's see, PDF file of this. So I can read this nicely like this. And one of the cool things with the peps is that they have, as I mentioned, this discussions about how the features are implemented. So if I go to the motivation, I can see what, why was this feature included, and some of the more interesting discussions are within the rejected ideas, what, what things were not included and why were they rejected from the PEPs. Okay, um, so just to sum up a little bit, PEPs, uh, they're fantastic to read if you look, learn, want, want to figure out why some features are designed as they are. PEPs are not tutorials. That there are a few uh, exceptions to this. Uh, PEP 636, for instance, is a great tutorial on the pattern matching thing. Um, but there, yeah, usually better ways if you're looking to learn how to use a feature. Then you should go out, look for the tutorials. But in general, PEPs are fun to read. So, yeah, thank you so much. And this is me. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Up next, we have Jonathan. Hello. Uh, so I'm Jonathan. I like to build fun things. Not all of those things are useful. Uh, this talk will be about a fun thing. I don't know if it's going to be useful. So many of us use pip. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows, but apparently pip is also a backronym for pip installs packages, which got me thinking, what exactly is a package? I mean, we know of source distributions. We know of wheels. Um, if we've been around a while, maybe we've heard of eggs. Um, but I was at a talk um, of yesterday, I think, and they mentioned that you can put a command line tool inside of a package. And it was a compiled binary. It was Clang format. So we can put command line tools. So I thought, well, how about CPython? Could we put that in a package? Specifically, could we put that in a wheel? Um, in which case, then, pip wouldn't be pip install packages. It would be pip install Python. Um, so we're going to do a demo. I want to say that there's no shenanigans here. Um, this is actually like, OK, there's a little shenanigans, but um, only because I didn't want to rely on the conference Wi-Fi. Um, and nobody wanted to see something download for two minutes. But you can follow along. You have to be on Linux. I just thought of this yesterday, so I didn't have time to build everything. Um, so let's go to a terminal. So this is the uh, Python 3.7 slim image, so we have Python, um, it's an older version. We can't use the walrus operator. Um, so let's just pip install. Um, unfortunately, someone's already taken the name CPython, and uh, Python is like uh, locked. You can't give it. Uh, so I said, give me Python, give me Python, um, and we're going to want a version that is, let's say, compatible with uh, 3.9.0. an equal sign. So this is going to be used a cache wheel. It would download, but it takes like two minutes to download, so nobody wants to see that. Um, this is a real wheel. It's Mini Linux 2014. It actually passes the Mini Linux 14 standard. Um, it's run through audit wheel. Um, that said, it does vendor a whole bunch of shared libraries. Um, and this could be done for other operating systems. Um, Unfortunately, this is the boring part where we all sit and wait for pip to unzip things and install a whole lot of files. Um, and we also see that I'm running as root. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> YOLO. Uh, so now, of course, we have Python now uh, 3.9, 12, but we're not going to call it Python 3.9 because that might shadow uh, your system Python. So it's going to be GM for give me Python 3.9. Um, it works. Um, you can do things. It has shared libraries. Um, so what? Uh, so we installed CPython by pip. Of course, could we install packages in that pip as well? Like, could we do Python inside Python inside Python? Um, so let's try it. Uh, so we need to do GM Python. 
we're going to run pip, and we're going to install give me Python. So this will work. Um, it takes a while. <laughs> uh, and oh, I need to say install. Yes, that would be helpful. Um, so this will go and fetch uh, Python 3.10. Um, it's going to take a while, so I'm going to skip over to this one that already has this installed. Um, unfortunately, you don't get a command line shell. Because this is inside another Python, it doesn't work. But we can just run the uh, module. And now we have free time. All right, thank you. Oh, that's it. All right. Yeah. John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. I'm waiting for the inevitable future when just everything is on PyPI. It's going to be great. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have Yella talking to us about PEP 688. Let's give him a round of applause. Good morning. I'm Yella Zelsta. I'm a Python core developer interested in static typing. And I'm here today to talk about the buffer protocol. The buffer protocol is a way for type implemented in C to allow access to the raw bytes inside the representation, like you can use it as a bytes object, a numpy array, but not for, for example, a string, which isn't a raw array of bytes under the hood. But I told you I'm interested in typing, so when I write a function like this, I want to put type annotations. And the problem here is I don't have anything to put in those question marks. There's no way in Python right now to say any buffer type. So I want to fix that, and I wrote a pep for it, pep 688. And the first version that I wrote, which is now up on the peps website, adds this new buffer type um, that you can, it's implemented in C. It has an, a subclass implementation that just checks whether the buffer protocol is implemented. So you can check that the bytes array object is a buffer, a numpy array is a buffer, a string object is not a buffer. And it works fine for the function that I showed. But there's a problem. What if I want something more than just a buffer protocol? Like, I want to also have a buffer that provides a length, which is a pretty common thing to have for a buffer, because inherently it's a collection of bytes, so it has a length. But in a type system, there's no way to say you want both a concrete class, like buffer is right now, but also a protocol, like sized. So I have another problem. I still can't write the types that I want to write. And I don't know how to fix that yet, so I'm going to show some ideas, and I would like to hear from people who have feedback on these, what they think the right solution is. The one thing I thought of is to actually make it possible to implement a buffer protocol in Python by adding a dunder buffer method that you could just implement in your own types too. And the nice thing about it is that PyPy actually has the same thing already. I guess they need that because in PyPy everything is Python, so you have to implement this in Python. It's also nice that it is useful outside of static typing, potentially. But it's also a lot more complicated than just adding support for typing, because it changes the runtime representation of buffer types. And in the C protocol, there's this uh, slot for releasing a buffer, and I don't know how I would represent that in Python. So there's also a simpler idea. We could just add a dunder buffer flag to these types. You set it to true if it's a buffer. And if it's not a buffer, it's just not there. It's a lot simpler. but it doesn't really feel like other Dunder attributes because there's nothing else that really works this way. It also makes it pretty easy for types to lie about being buffers, which I don't like. So yeah, if you have any feedback on which of those approaches would work well, uh, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, come find me during the rest of the conference or uh, talk about it on discuss.python.org or just email me. Thank you. And up next, we have Nick. All right, good morning, PyCon. Uh, so today I'm gonna to be talking about a post-pandemic meetup and an organizer's dilemma. So my name is Nick Mo. I am the CliPy um, meetup organizer. So that's the Cleveland, Py yes, thank you. Cleveland Python meetup um, um, group. 
and I work as a data scientist at Trimble Transportation. You can see my little logo at the top uh, right corner, te left corner. All right. So um, the last Clipi meetup was two years ago, March 9th, 2020. I have a little picture here. It was an amazing day filled with pizza, laughs, and so the occasional, does anybody have a dongle here? That was the occasional thing, right? But as you all well know, um, the pandemic has changed everything. So what has happened since, uh, since then, right? We, we had to go virtual, right? And everybody was like, virtual meetings? Ooh, yay, right? Uh, so there were, little, there were a lot of, there was a lot of like uncertainty about that. So how did this affect us? As I said, once we shared the news with the community, they were like, Yes, meetings, no one, no one said that, right? So there was this dilemma of how can we get them engaged? So as I said, there was a lot of uncertainty. Clip I seemed to last people think about the pandemic was going on. There are so many things going, there was so much uncertainty about what was going on in the world. Um, figuring out a way to engage with the community was tricky. How did we, the best way to like get them excited about going back to virtual meetings after being in countless meetings at work all day? Finding people to give talks you would think would be easier. It's a virtual meeting, less pressure in person. No, it's not as easy. And overall, personally for me as one of the co-organizers, it was pretty taxing having to deal with my, uh, my life, work, and worrying about how to get our community back together and still strong. So <clears throat> how did Clipi fare throughout the pandemic? Well, I think we crushed it, right? We've had 21 very successful virtual meetups since our last in-person meetup. What does it mean? For the last two years, 2020, 2021, we've had a meet virtual meetup every second Monday of the month, nonstop. The community has been amazing and the turnout has been super encouraging. Honestly, there were days where I felt like we had to cancel it because I don't know what to do. But you can see there are a couple of pictures we have here about all our virtual meetups. So it was a really encouraging and really wonderful. I loved it. So what's the goal for 2022? In-person in Clipi meetups again. That's the goal for, for the 2022. And thanks to my company, Trimble, they are going to be sponsoring us and giving us a venue and feeding us too. So we're really excited about that. So if you're in Cleveland, please come to Clipi every second Monday of the month. Um, you can see our next one is on May 9th. So if you're in the Cleveland area, please come by. Uh, you can see this, that's our um, Twitter handle and that's my Twitter handle at Spirix at, on Twitter. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Klepi. You guys, if you guys are watching this, I love you guys so much. Thank you, PyCon. All right, have a nice day. Awesome. And next up, we're going to hear from Dustin about what is it going to be about? Next up, we have a parade of regional conferences. So uh, I'm going to ask the organizers to come over here by the side. Uh, so we're going to go through just some uh, excitingly upcoming rec recent and, uh, or sorry, regional conferences that are going to be happening in the next year. Uh, so if you like PyCon, maybe there's a conference happening near you. And let's see, where's Chuk? All right, let's give all the regional conferences a round of applause and they're going to tell you why you should come. You're first. Euro Python. So um, yeah, Euro Python is in July. I would say that uh, the best uh, PyCon in Europe will be Euro Python. Um, the second one will be maybe PyCon Italy. <laughs> so um, yeah, so uh, we, we it's like very similar format. Uh, who really enjoy PyCon here this week? Woo! Woo! So yeah, it will be very similar. We also have tutorial. We have um, conference talk for three days, and then we will have sprint. So. Um, also, we have PyData Track for those data folks. Um, you will find something that you like there. Um, and also, we have a lot of Guinness. Um, I think that would be the main difference. <laughs> so if you really like PyCon, if you really want to have another like, week-long conference, 
at maybe somewhere closer or further, I don't know, um, then, then yeah, please come. So yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> My name is Phoebe Polk, and I'm here to invite you to join me and many other Python people in beautiful Mission Bay, San Francisco, on Saturday, September 10th. It is a one-day outdoor Python conference in the park. Tickets are on sale now at our website, pybay.com. Call for proposals are open. Please submit a talk before uh, June 3rd, and I hope to see you again very soon at Pi Bay. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Yoshida. And I'm Peacock. Uh, we are co-vice chair of PyCon GP 2022 uh, from Japan. Uh, PyCon GP is the largest conference in Japan. Uh, this year, PyCon GP will be held in mid-October. Uh, CFP application will be start next Monday, uh, 9th of May. Uh, you can also make a talk online. The sponsor application will be start uh, also this month. You can appeal to Python users with the largest PyCon in Japan. Uh, we will inform you of the latest information on our blog, Twitter, and Facebook. For more information, please visit 2022.pycon.jp. Please join us. Thanks, and I'm the only one from Taiwan, as far as I know, in this conference. So if you're by chance also from Taiwan, please contact me like in this last day of conference. So Taiwan is hosting the uh, APAC, PyCon APAC this year, 2022 on September 3rd and 4th. And it's unfortunately a virtual conference because we still have very strict travel restrictions. Call for proposal, unfortunately, has ended. If you have already proposed, I hope you get selected. I'm not, I don't make that decision, so good luck. <laughs> uh, also, call for sponsors. We obviously, we are representing the talent group in Asia and APEC area, so you have access to like the best talents in the world. Takes it on sale now. Right now it's early bird. I think there are some late bird and some corporate selections. Please come join us online. I mean, that's all, thank you. Yeah, hello everyone, uh, I'm Patrick. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to invite you to PyCon Italy, which is gonna be next month in, in Florence. It's gonna be really nice. We have awesome keynoters. We have a PyData track, we have a web track, and uh, lots of interesting social events. And if you cannot join, because I, I know it's in a month, uh, we also have an online version, which is gonna be free. Uh, we should probably announce that soon. Uh, thank you. Hope to see you there. Good morning. We are here to invite you to go to Python Brazil this year. It, it will be between 70 and 23 October in Manaus in Amazon Forest Zone, and we will see talks uh, in Portuguese and Spanish, roundtables, sprint tutorial, lightning talks, open space, job fairs, and all, uh, all activities have signal language during, uh, have signal language. It will be an uh, online and in-person event, and there, are, there is a kid space. We are also going to have the Pilate conference, Brazil conference. We always have every year during the Python Brazil, so I would like to invite every Pilate to go to. And I hope I can see you there this year. Thank you. 